complete in Christ. We're continuing our series in Colossians. Colossians, a very powerful book. Oh my goodness, it's like the sister book uh, to Ephesians. It's like the Cliff's Notes on Romans. I mean, it's, it's just so power-packed. And now we're going to finish up chapter 2 with a quick review of what we saw last week and launch into chapter 3. Uh, and so as we look at where we have come from, remember last week uh, what we ended on, that the Bible is not a book of rules. Uh, Paul says, if you have died with Christ to the elementary principles or rules of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch? These all refer to things that are destined to perish with use in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men. The Bible is not about rules. Actually, when you understand the gospel, you break free from rules. The Bible is not uh, really about uh, rule keeping. The gospel is not about keeping a bunch of rules. It's about letting Jesus Christ rule in your heart by faith. And so we're talking about a miracle life. Rules are for the immature. Rules are for people who think they need railroad tracks but you're not a train, you're a child of God. Rules are for people who get nervous about sin and they look to Moses instead of Jesus. Rules are for the immature and the weaker brother who can't eat meat or thinks that uh, worship is about one day a week or thinks that they're under obligation to give a certain amount of money. Rules are for the weaker brother and you don't want to be that. You want to be the stronger brother or sister, the one who is growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So true Christian maturity is breaking free from rules and allowing Jesus Christ to rule in your heart. This Bible belt and Christianity around the world, we are inundated with rule keepers. We're told to make sure that you've joined this group and uh, are accountable to these people and sign this constitution and be a part of this movement and give this amount of money and do more and be more and be intentional and be a world changer and love more and be better and rededicate and recommit. This world is full of people that are telling us that we need to keep the rules. And Paul is literally saying the opposite. He would be furious and irate with what is happening in the church today. He would write another fiery epistle, much like Galatians, and it would read to the church at America, I, Paul. And he would be inundated with opposition, I'm sure, and rejection. People would accuse him as they did 2,000 years ago. Uh, but the gospel still stands. The gospel is not about rule keeping. It is about letting Jesus Christ rule in your heart by faith. And when we celebrate Easter, we, we celebrate Jesus risen from the dead. And when we wake up every day and we say, I'm not about rules, we are also celebrating that Jesus rose from the dead. Because we're saying he lives in us. We're saying he's real. We're saying we trust him. We're saying he's enough. We're saying the power of his spirit will guide me. We are saying that his life inside of us will cause us to bear fruit. We're saying that Jesus rose from the dead and lives in us. And so as Paul bashes rule keeping, which is exactly what he's doing, he also shows the fallacy in it, a very specific flaw. He says it's of the commandments of men. And then he says, these are matters which have the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion. Ouch, that's an insult. Self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. See, Re religiosity says your body is evil. Religiosity says your body is the enemy. Religion says treat your body harshly. Religion says you must elevate the spirit and then diminish the physical. That's not Christianity. Christianity says your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. The real gospel says you offer your body as holy and acceptable to God. 
Real Christianity is healthy where all of you are embraced. You are embraced, spirit, soul, and body. Every ounce of you is embraced and accepted by God. He does not accept two-thirds of you. He does not invite you to a life relating to him as spirit and soul, rejecting the body. No, your body is in this. You are a new creation, and you, not two-thirds of you, you are are holy and acceptable and righteous and blameless and you're a child of God and every part of you is okay with God. Do you hear that? If you don't believe that yet, if you believe there's just a righteous compartment of you, then you have a partial gospel. You are righteous as a child of God because of what Jesus did. Every ounce of you is righteous to him And he relates to you as if you've never sinned a day in your life. And he sees no flaw in you and he finds no fault with you. And that's the truth that builds us up. And oh my goodness, then we see the gospel shining more brightly than ever. And then it's not about a ticket to heaven and just getting saved. Suddenly, it's about a God who is totally into all that we are and loves us and likes us and wants us to be a part of this. No more poster boards about less of us and more of him. Nope, he wants all of us and all of him together in a beautiful union, vine and branches. It was his idea. He loves the branches. The branches get to be a part of this. He loves the branches. Amen? All right, so now we're jumping into chapter three of Colossians. Paul says, therefore, here's the application, therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Stinking thinking happens when you think you stink. When you think you stink, you'll engage in stinking thinking. When you believe you're the fragrant aroma of Christ, all of a sudden you start thinking that way, that you smell good because of Jesus and his life in you and because you're the new self. When you realize you're the fragrant aroma of Jesus, you start acting like it. Now, this message, unfortunately, is rare. You know that. You know that you could draw a circle around your city You could look around the United States, and yes, you'll find a peppering of people around the globe that are talking about your new identity in Christ. They're talking about the finished work of Jesus. They're talking about the goodness of the gospel. But let's be candid. It's really easy to throw a stone one mile from here, one mile from anywhere, and you can also find the opposite message. You can also find that you've got a wicked heart, that you're a dirty sinner, that you're a saint and a sinner at the same time, that you're two people. Guess what? If you believe that, you're going to act like it, and it's not going to be pretty. If you believe you're two people, you're going to act like two people. If you believe you're a dirty, rotten sinner, you're going to do dirty, rotten sins. But if you believe what Paul is saying and what God is saying about you, then you're going to start to think and act like it. And that's just the truth. Paul says, you have been raised up with Christ. So there's your reason. He elevates you. God elevates you and he esteems you and he puts you in a place of honor and respect at his table. And then he says, look what I've done for you. Look how you've been invited in. Look how you are a part of my family now. Therefore, walk in a way that fits with the beautiful way I have esteemed you. God lifts you up. He builds you up. He encourages you. He calls you his own. He gives you value and worth, and he gives you union with him. And then he says, Now let's talk about your thinking. Legalism says, let's talk about your actions. No foundation, except you need to do better. Shame and guilt and manipulation and a carrot on a stick. If you will just do your part, then God will do his part. And it's just a little bit outside of your reach right now. But you keep doing your part and you'll get there 
And then next week, it's again out of my reach. And next week, again, and constantly, I'm shooting for something. And really, the gospel is saying, God gave it to you up front. He gave it to you day one, moment one, when you were taken out of Adam and put in Christ, you were given everything you need for life and godliness. So he continues, he says, set your mind on things above, not on things that are on earth. Now that would be sort of an, of an aloof type thinking. You've got this pie in the sky mentality. You're a space cadet. Oh, you're just thinking about spiritual things. You know, look at you. Well, we need you to take the garbage out. We need you to <laughs> wash the dishes. We need you to do the recycling. We need you to live life. You got to take the kids to school. You got to get the work done. There's a laundry list of things to do. Paul is not saying for you to go sit in an ivory tower and just think spiritual thoughts. He's saying that you are spiritual and you are lofty and you are a heavenly creature on earth. And the two collide. Heaven meets earth in Jesus and now heaven meets earth in you. And so you can do the earthly things, but have a heavenly perspective. And it's a fit. When Adam and Eve were running around in that garden, they were doing earthy things. But they were doing them as perfect beings who were walking with God. But it was earthy. There was dirt and plants and trees. And there were animals and the sky and rain and physicality and oh my goodness i mean you know it was physical but it was spiritual but it was physical and we are seeing the collision of heaven and earth in you christ in your physical shell jesus making you a new creation inside of an earthen vessel the glory is not of us, but we get to participate in it. We get to share in it. We get to possess it. And that's awesome. Set your mind on things above. Did you know you can set your mind? A lot of people say, no, I got to be true to myself. And what they are really saying is, I got to be true to how I feel. I must choose according to what I feel because I don't want to be a hypocrite. I got to be true to my feelings. That's not the truth. That's not the gospel. The gospel is not be true to your feelings. Sometimes feelings fly in the face of the truth. Sometimes popular opinion has almost nothing to do with the truth. And here's the catch. When you choose to set your mind on the truth, you are being yourself and your spirit and your soul and your body are jiving and clicking and connecting and you're acting like who you are and the truth is real and you're an alien from another place, but you're here. And when you believe the truth from that other realm in Christ, you are actually believing the healthiest message you can possibly believe about yourself and about your God. And so the world has a philosophy, and God has a philosophy. It's like AM and FM. You've heard the old analogy. Father's mentoring cha uh, channel, FM, and then alternate messages, AM. And you can change the station. You can change the channel. But only one, only one channel is really where you make melody in your heart, and everything jives, and you're dancing to the beat, and the whole thing just fits with your very nature. Paul says, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Oh my goodness, this is not what I'm hearing. I'm hearing out there, I'm hearing a puny and pathetic gospel. It goes a little something like this. I'm so glad you got saved. We think, around here, we think grace is great for getting saved. I mean, that's so, you know, Ephesians, for by grace you're saved through faith, not of yourself, is a gift of God. We love grace. But now, <laughs> but now that you're saved, thanks for entering in by grace, but now, now that you're in, 
uh, we've got some ways that you need to get close to God. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, you need, if you would just do your quiet time and if you would just do your prayer group and if you would just get in a small group and accountability, all we need is prayer group, accountability group, small group, all, uh, Wednesday night group, Sunday morning group. We need you, if you could just, and then if you would just study the Bible and then share your faith and then if you would just, we really need you to sign that contract where you're giving, you know, then you will get closer to God. This is God's way for you to get closer. Folks, basically, we're buying our way. We're earning and achieving our way through our doing. And what Paul is saying, I want you to see the closeness. Please, I beg of you, just look at the closeness in this passage. Hidden with Christ in God. Take an envelope, put it in another, then put it in another. Hidden inside of Christ, inside of God. You are with Christ as close to God as Jesus, enveloped, sealed, signed, sealed, and delivered, locked in, safe, secure, as close as oneness is. You're one spirit with the Lord. This is not my idea. It's not some trendy focus. This is Colossians chapter 3, verse 3. You were taken by God and ripped out of Adam, and you were placed in Jesus, inside of God, and this is how close you are to him. This is Paul's idea. This is God's idea. This is not some trendy focus or special emphasis. This is the foundation of for every day you live on this planet, how close are you? How close is your Jesus? And you're going to have to decide AM or FM. Alternative messages, AM says, get busy. Get busy to get close. FM says, God was busy through Jesus and it is finished. Only one of these can be true. Think about it. Somebody's not telling the truth. They may not realize it, but somebody's wrong. If I'm wrong, I'm willing to be wrong. If we're wrong, we're willing to be wrong. But Colossians 3, verse 3, means somebody's wrong about closeness with God. Somebody's wrong. And the beautiful side of that is that we can be right about being right because God made us right. And God made us close. And God made us clean. And God made us one. And so we are not inching our way closer. We're celebrating what Jesus has done. You have died, past tense, and now your condition is that you are hidden with Christ in God. Amen? Wow. Verse 4 when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. You got to put God first. You got to make God number one. Is that what it says? Again, puny and pathetic. You don't make God anything. God is God. And Christ is our life. Do you hear that? He's not competing with T-ball. He's not upset that you love that NFL team too much. Take off that jersey. It's an idol. I mean, everybody knows that God is a Cowboys fan. <laughs> but seriously, do you see how we have engaged in a pathetic and puny view of God when we start thinking he's a priority on a list? We got God, family, country, t-ball, and ballet. And, you know, we keep accidentally letting God dance down into sixth place, and we got to get him fifth, and get him fourth, and get him third. He's almost first. As soon as he gets in first place, well, it's playoff time. Yeah. If that's your God, that is sad. Christ is your life. I mean, I don't even know if I can do this passage justice. Christ is my life. What can I say about that? I, I'm fused and bonded to him. Christ is your everything. 
Christ is the very essence of the new self that's been given to you. You're born of God, born of Him, born from above, fused and bonded and one, and Christ is your everything. So everything you do is spiritual. You know, when you're sweeping the shelves and getting the you know, lint out of the corner of the room and you're dusting and vacuuming and, and driving down the highway and frustrated and angry, all of that. Everything is spiritual. Everything can be an expression of Jesus. Christ is your life. Christ is not your church. Christ is not your service. Christ is not your hour. Christ is not your quiet time. Christ is not your priority. Christ is not your principles. Christ is not your perspective. Christ is not your conservative living. Christ is not your behavior. Christ is your life. Christ is your everything. Do you see the difference? When you see the difference, rule-keeping looks puny and pathetic. Religiosity looks absurd and ridiculous. Trying to get what you've already got seems insane because Christ is your life and you've been hidden with Christ in God. Verse 5, therefore, let's talk about your body. Consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. So do you see what he's done? He's built the case. He's saying, look at you. Number one, you're raised. Number two, you're seated with Christ. Number three, you're bonded and fused and hidden and you're in God and you're new and you're different and you're clean and you're close. Therefore, what are you going to do with this? What are you going to do with this? You're going to have a contradiction? You're going to be this beautiful, new, amazing child of God and then offer your body to sin? That's crazy because alarms will go off. Your heart will hate it. You will be miserable. So here, how about we just save some time? I could save you a year. I could save you a year of chasing something that you're not really about. We could save you the time of pursuing something that's not really who you are. That reaction, you've reacted that way five and 50 times. That temptation, you've given in five and 50 times. But what if you knew next time? What if you knew you're elevated, you're raised, you're seated, you're one, you're clean, you're close, you're not going to buy the stupid lie that you actually want this. I know better now. I know better. I'm believing my dad. He's right about me. I'm not going to be tricked. I'm not going to be fooled again by that. I know the truth about me. I know now why the alarms were going off. I know now why I can't act like my next door neighbor. He's fine with it. He's cool with it. Something else inside of me is different. What is it? You're new and you're different and you're clean and you're close and Jesus is in you. So consider the members of your body as dead to sin. Does that mean kill your body? No, don't kill your body, don't hate your body, don't detest your body. Your body can serve an incredible purpose. Count your body as dead to sin. God, my body belongs to you today. And that means all of me belongs to you today. So Paul is presenting a therefore, and here's his rationale. He says, why wouldn't you want to give your body to that stuff? Well, it's because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. Now, if you have an immature or legalistic view of this, you just got scared. You just got scared when we read this. But here's what I want to say to you this morning. You are not a child of disobedience. You're not an unbeliever. You're not going to face God's wrath. Here's Paul's logic. Why act like them 
when you're not them. We already know God doesn't like that. We already know the end of the story. There's wrath at the end of the story for, the, for whom? For them, for the sons of disobedience. Why? Because of what they're doing, because of their unbelief, but also because of their deeds done in the body. We know how the story ends, and if we know that our dad, who's given us the new heart and the new nature, if we know he's against that, and he's not about that, and he'll never celebrate that, in fact, quite the opposite, and we know what's going to happen to the sons of disobedience, then why, get this, why would we act like them when we're not them? That's what he's saying. It makes perfect sense. Why act like someone that you're not? Now, are you scared? You could. You could act like them. There's no condemnation, except you'll be miserable. Oh, you'll be forgiven, but you'll be forgiven and miserable. (laughs) Oh, you'll be forgiven, but you'll be forgiven and discontent and stirring things up inside. And oh my goodness, you're looking for freedom and you're struggling and you're Maybe you live in denial for a while, but then <laughs> that doesn't work either. You try to shove it down, but the presence of Christ in you is real and irrevocable. The gifts and the calling of God will never be revoked. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will never stop inspiring and motivating you. Therefore, that will never go away. The power of God in you that is spurring you on will never vanish and never cease. So why act like them if you're not them? He goes on, he says, and in them, see, here it is, the clarity is so in our face, and in them you also once walked when you were living in them. So there's two things, walking and living, walking and living. You used to live in them. You don't anymore. Where do you live? You live in Christ. You used to live in your sins. You were dead in your sins. Now you're alive in your Savior. So why would you want to walk in a way that doesn't fit with where you live? Right? I live in Texas and I talk like a Texan. I go to Canada, and they say, you must be from Texas. <laughs> and then I try to talk Canadian, but it never seems to work that well. I can fake it till I make it, but I live in Texas. You walk in a way that fits where you live. And when you try to walk a different way, there's a collision There's a conflict. There's a stirring. Please hear me. I'm not trying to get you to behave. No. You'll you'll make your choice. I'm not trying to get you to behave. I'm trying to get you to see that you're a slave of righteousness. You can't get away from it. You'll be miserable if you don't express Jesus. Not my fault, not God's fault. You chose, you said, I want you, Jesus. This is what he does to people. It's too late. You're beautifully saved and beautifully enslaved to righteousness. You're connected and bonded and fused. It's too late. Look at you. You got the new heart. What are you going to do now? Be miserable or express it? All right. But now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. He goes on, verse 9, he says, Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices. Do you see the logic? I mean, come on. You know, people throw stones at the message of grace They think we're saying, go out and sin? No. It's the opposite, man. Because of God's grace, you now have a new self, and that is Paul's exclusive reason for not lying. Right here. Don't lie to each other. Why? Because you're new. You're not a liar. You're a truth teller. When you tell a lie, the truth calls out from inside of you. 
You're not a liar, so don't lie. You're the new self, so act like it. You're the new self, so be yourself. We are not hearing this enough. I mean, in churchianity, we're hearing deny yourself, die to self, get rid of self. The gospel says, please be yourself because you're the new self. <laughs> Somebody's wrong. Somebody's wrong. And that means there's a beautiful truth that once you know it, oh my goodness, it's radically against the grain, but the truth works and lies don't. Are you tired of being tired? Are you tired of thinking you're dirty and distant? Are you tired of trying to get rid of the ugly you? Paul says, you past tense have laid aside the old self and look at it as he continues. He says, past tense, and you have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. Have put off and have put on. Is there anything in process? Of course, come on. We're all learning and growing. We know that we're learning and growing, but look at the renewal. It's a renewal of what? Renewed to what? A true knowledge. You don't need a new heart. You've got one. You don't need a new spirit. You've got one. We just need a new understanding. We're getting renewed to a true knowledge of who God has made us to be. All right, as we finish these last few verses, a renewal in which there is no racism, no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free man, Christ is all and in all. He doesn't care where you came from, what your last name is, how much money you make, what country you're from, what your skin color is, what job you've got. He doesn't care. This renewal to a true understanding of him is for anybody and everybody that wants it. Right there's your cure for racism. We don't just need to, you know, uh, change our words. Let's change our vocabulary. Let's, education is the answer. No, God's vantage point, God's mentality is the answer. Not vocabulary, but setting your mind. So, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. All right, type A personalities just got out their notebooks and they decided that they were going to make a laundry list for this week. Let me see. What am I going to work on? Number one, I'm going to grip my teeth and work on compassion. Number two, I'm going to work on kindness. And when I get all those figured out, I'm going to tell everybody that I'm now working on humility. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> Do you see? That's the flesh's approach. The flesh gets out the rules. The flesh gets out the benchmark. The flesh gets out the laundry list. Jesus says, get dressed, because look at you, you're awesome. Put on, put on the outside what's already on the inside. You could put on immorality, but it doesn't fit. You know that what not to wear show? You, know, you remember that, that was popular, what not to wear. They raid your closet, they tell you you look horrible, then they give you a budget and they go shopping with you. You put off and you put on, and you put off and you put on. That's what God is saying here. Look at you. How about you wear some clothes that fit? He goes on. He says, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Now, that's not what Jesus said. Do you remember? It was called the Sermon on the Mount. Do you remember? It was called the Lord's Prayer. That's what we call it today. I'm not sure that it should be called the Lord's Prayer because there were many prayers, including the one about being one with Him, vine and branches, you know. But we call it the Lord's Prayer. And in it, what does He say? Well, let's back up. First, He says, amputate body parts, cut off your hand, pluck out your eye. He tells the rich man in another place, go sell everything. Jesus also says, 
in that sermon, he says, let people beat you up. Give money to whomever asks of you without question. And, uh, you know, uh, by the way, uh, get right with your brother before you hoist that animal on the altar. What's he talking about? He's talking to people that offer animals on altars. Who are they? They're the Jews. When, when is this? Before the cross? What does he say about forgiveness? It's the opposite of Colossians 3.13. I hope you hear this. Jesus taught the opposite of Colossians 3.13. He said, if you forgive others, your heavenly Father will forgive you. If you do not forgive others, your heavenly Father will not forgive you. So in the Sermon on the Mount, there's a condition. You better get busy being nice, and then God will forgive you. But if you're not nice, God will not forgive you. I ask you, is that the gospel? Does God just forgive the nice Christians? <laughs> so we got to put our thinking caps on. Something's happening here. Context. Before the cross, he's telling them, cut off your hand, pluck out your eye, be perfect, and imagine you wanting to be forgiven by God when you're a total jerk to other people. He's getting them to think about their hypocrisy and what they really deserve. Now, Paul has given us the new covenant. Paul has given us the New Testament divine order of things. God forgave you first. Now forgive others just like God forgave you. Which came first, chicken or the egg? The answer is a chicken. <laughs> but which came first, God's forgiveness of you or your forgiveness of other people? God forgave you first. Colossians 3.13, forgive others as the Lord forgave you. All right. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. If you're going to wear something, wear love. If you're not sure how to handle a situation, handle it with love. Put on love. Put on Christ, the beautiful bond of peace. Wow. We've celebrated so much of the gospel today. I hope you heard what you needed to hear, that you're clean and you're close and you're one and you're fused and you're bonded and you got a new heart and a new nature and a new spirit and you're not dirty and distant anymore and now you can walk in a way that fits where you live. And where do you live? You live smack dab in the middle of Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this gospel and this truth that we don't have to make some heroic effort today through dedication and commitment to try to get in a better place. We're in the best place. We're in you. We don't have to do something to try to improve our condition or improve our status. We're seated right next to you. We're at the table. We're feasting on your goodness. We love it. We thank you for the invitation, and now we're in the family. We're clean, and we're close, and we're new, and we're right. And it's all because of you, and we believe you, and we're changing the channel. We're no longer going to listen to those alternative messages. We're listening to you, Father. You, our mentor, our counselor, our guide into all truth, we believe you, and we're changing the channel. In Jesus' name, amen.